Hi, and thank you for joining us for this week's installment of the Apartment Academy podcast, the multifamily industry's only operations focused podcast and your institute for higher NOI. I am your host, the Dean of the Apartment Academy, Daniel Cunningham, and today's guest lecturer, Jennifer Stachokas, who's Executive Managing Director over at Western Wealth Capital. Um, and Jennifer and I had a, a discussion that was, uh, if you were going to listen to any multifamily operations podcast, any of the Apartment Academy podcasts, this would be the one to listen to. Um, and it was so good we broke it into two parts. So we're going to you're gonna hear first episode, you're going to hear Jennifer talk about starting a, a property management company from scratch, what she thought about, what's important in that process, and then the technology that goes into streamlining a, uh, the operations of a management company. Uh, that'll be part two. So lots of good stuff t- today. Uh, here is Professor Sachokas. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the Apartment Academy. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Very excited about today's um, episode. You have such an interesting um, history in in this business. You most recently have been doing something very few people get to do, which is to essentially start a management company from scratch. Uh, you, you have a, a um, you know a, a reputation in the business for not only being one of the most well liked folks, but just uh, your your experience on the marketing and technology side is is um, uh, extremely deep and there's a lot of things to talk about. So I don't know how we're gonna compact things down today, but but um, let's presume not everyone knows who you are and your background. And let's kind of start there, Jennifer. You, How did you, it's always interesting the journey to get into multifamily and uh, and then talk about kind of what's, what's led you to your position as uh, Executive Managing Director at Western Wealth Capital uh, today. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So. You know, I like to think I have a unique story on how I got into the business, but as I talk to more and more people, I don't think it is very unique. So I was living at an apartment community and going back to graduate school and knew that I needed to do something that had a little more flexibility. And I was in the elevator of the building and saw a flyer that said, looking for fun, enthusiastic people that want to save money on their rent. And I thought, perfect. Um, Sounds like a great job. So went down to the leasing office, applied for the position and was offered it on the spot, thinking this was just gonna be a year and a half gig um, to get me through graduate school, and then I would move on. And I think as many people find in this industry that even though this isn't what you set out to do because you just didn't know it existed, um, you end, end up getting sucked in and really enjoy the space and the industry and the relationships that you build. And so as I worked, um, I took a job originally with Lincoln Property Company and spent the first 15 years of my career with them. I worked on site in leasing as a manager and then moved into a training position um, after my first year and then took on marketing, ended up uh, leading the marketing training and pricing departments for Lincoln out of Dallas and then decided that it was time to kind of spread my wings and joined Pinnacle to help them build their platform as it related to training, marketing, pricing, et cetera, and help them launch uh, three separate brands during that time. And then I had the unique opportunity of joining Western Wealth. So I got a call from a recruiter saying, we're looking for somebody to help bring management in-house for a company based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, And it's based in Phoenix. And I thought, wow, this sounds too good to be true. Um, It was where I was living. It's something that I had as an aspiration in my career. And it certainly felt like the right time and the right place. And so took the jump. And right after I accepted the job is when the world kind of shut down with COVID. So it was a really unique environment to be building a management company with a pandemic that many of us or all of us had never seen throughout our career to go through such a challenging time. And so fast forward two and a half years. Yeah, as if that wasn't hard enough. (laughs) Exactly. As if it wasn't stressful enough um, building a company, but then layering on a pandemic. But I do think there's a lot of bright light too, that sometimes when I look back, if we didn't have that isolation and that ability to just really focus, I don't know if we could have gotten as much done as we did in such a short amount of time. So definitely a bright light there. That's interesting. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, it is a big leap all on its own to go from generally a marketing focused career to now suddenly being charge of 
operations and starting those operations from scratch. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how do you um, those first those first months when you're starting a, a, a management company, what's most important? What do you really focus on? What, what are the things you must get right, right out of the gate? That's a great question. And so it was one of those things right out of the gate that you have to prioritize and you have to figure out what are the things when I'm setting up a company that I absolutely have to have to operate. And um, because I had over a 20 year history in this industry, I had made a lot of connections and had a large network. And when people heard that I was starting a new business, they all wanted a piece of that business too. And so you have to politely navigate to let people know, yes, I see value in what you do, but it's not my priority today. And so really documenting out, and I have notebook, I have an entire notebook from the first 30 days of starting Western Wealth of just note after note and reprioritizing what we need to focus on to have a mission critical business. And so a lot of those things where you have to set up the property management system, you have to be able to pay people. So you need to have your payroll system set up uh, with that HR functionality. You have to be able to onboard employees. And then when you think about what are all the service contracts that you have to have for the day-to-day -day operations, we set all of those things up, You know, the screening of the applicants, and the things that we had to have, the marketing resources, the websites, the Google My Business accounts. And then as we got through all of that and fine tuned what we had, we were able to go to phase two and say, what are those next phase of things that we wanna focus on? And then really with COVID, there were times where it may not have even been something on our radar, but it went to the top of the list because COVID forced it to. So for instance, you know, self-guided touring and flexible payment options. Those things became critical where maybe they weren't on my radar right out of the gate, uh, but they kind of piggybacked and, and got to the top of the list because it was a necessity for a problem we were facing at our business. Uh, I, I, I had a similar experience myself when I was working for um, a developer in Los Angeles who decided to bring things in-house. Um, uh, I had been on the asset management side, so I had had a kind of a taste of operations, but not, but not really. Um, I, I hadn't been introduced to kind of the breadth of systems and technologies that were in use on site like you had. Um, and I remember it probably it took us three or four months uh, to really get the things that you're just talking about now in place, up and running. It sounds like you did that in 30 days. <laughs> That's correct. It was 28 days to be exact. Um, we had a very short window. And I think sometimes, and I've seen this throughout my entire life, sometimes the more you take on, the more efficient you are, um, the more effective you can be because you have to be. So sometimes when you have such a long runway to work on a project or there's an open-ended task that you're looking at, you may not be as focused as you would be if you were driven to have to do something in a shorter amount of time. Uh, when we, we set out to do the management company, we were thinking that there was going to be a larger window to set up the infrastructure. And then COVID changed all of that and it accelerated the business plan to start bringing things in house, trying to get our arms around, you know, all of these properties and having more control. And it just dictated what we were able to do. And that's why it was so important to prioritize and constantly reshuffle the deck to figure out what we needed to focus on when. And I think too, it's really important to go back. I know you asked me about, you know, having a career and kind of building my name in marketing and how that worked um, transitioning. And one thing when I was interviewing for the role is I, I really shared that I'm going to come at this a little bit different than your traditional candidate who maybe was an RVP or ran operations at a company because my entire career has really been focused on property performance. And the way I look at that is it's a holistic approach where operations is in the center and in the middle. And all of the functions that I was used to overseeing were in support of that. So I was touching operations every single day, even though I may not have been responsible for that, that aspect of the business, but it was something that I was completely in tune with 
because I understood that all of the different departments that I led had a direct impact on operations and property performance. And so I had a different lens to look at that than maybe a traditional operations leader did. Oh, I love that. So give us more detail about that. Tell us more. What is what is what does property performance mean? How do you measure it? How do you optimize it? Absolutely. So property performance to me is, you know, when you think of your four P's, people, price, product, promotion. So a lot of the departments that I oversaw, for instance, training, right? Training can have a direct impact on property performance. So it's the marriage between operations, looking at analytics, looking at your business intelligence platform to figure out where you need some additional assistance. Uh, looping in your marketing team, your pricing team, and your training team, because those three teams are really critical to the success of any property. It can't just be, um, it can't be in a silo. And I think our industry can really find themselves being in a silo in especially large organizations, right? You have these large departments that are working independently, but they need to be working interdependently. And so the meetings really need to be with your RPM or your RVP, your trainer, your marketing director, and your revenue manager, because all of those things touch property performance. If you move a lever on pricing just because it's easy, you're not fixing the root cause of the problem. Where if you've got all of those minds in the room or on Zoom, they can troubleshoot and really poke holes in things and say, okay, we can adjust price. However, price really isn't the issue. And here's the data that supports that pricing isn't an issue. I actually think it's maybe the product. We don't have make ready product or the product isn't showing as well as it should. Or maybe we have an issue with people where they're not really managing their CRM and their queue, those leads that are coming through and nurturing and following up with them. So when you have that discipline of having all of those different components in one meeting, you can actually get to the bottom of the root cause of a problem and then fix it instead of just putting the Band-Aid on it of you know, driving more leads to the property or reducing rent when maybe neither of those are the true issue of what's going on. Uh, I, I don't think that I have seen anyone describe their core operations team in that way, working together in that way. Have you seen that at work where you've got pricing and marketing and your operations people regularly getting together to talk about the properties? They, they, they usually seem so sort of on their own, siloed as you the term you used earlier. Yeah, I think it happens more often than not that it's siloed. You know, to me, there's nothing better than when I walk down the hall of my office and I see my, you know, head of pricing and my head of marketing, marketing and training sitting in a room together on a call with an RVP because they're problem solving and they're working on things together. Because, you know, when you work in silos and you adjust or whoever has the loudest voice is normally what happens. Whoever has the loudest voice ends up winning the argument, meaning, okay, if the operator's saying just drop the price and you drop the price, think about the, um, the impact that you've made to the business and then what the impact is to the value of the asset in the overall life cycle of the property. And so, okay, yes, we can lower the rate by $50, but by doing that, how much value am I minimizing at that asset over the long-term hold? And so I think when you can really centralize those conversations and have a healthy debate about it, you will see value rising and you'll see the collaboration um, working better with, with and amongst the teams. The, the idea that you could have a, uh, you know, these key roles on board right away, uh, somebody who's head of marketing training, head of pricing, et cetera, um, Western Wealth had only... 10, 15 properties at the outset, right? Yes. Yeah. So that seems like a real luxury to have those kind of roles available in, on the, and I know Western Wealth is bit, much bigger now. You've grown it, I don't know, three, four, four times the size. Um, but uh, how did you make room for, in the budget for senior people like that with a smaller property management company? A, a lot of management companies, I think, sacrifice probably training first. You know, a lot of, you don't see heads of training until you've got a company of like, I don't know, 25, 30 properties, maybe they, those kinds of people start showing up. Tell me, how did you, 
how do you prioritize people and make room for them in, in, in a business that has kind of historically narrow margins? Absolutely. And that's a fantastic question and something that I'm really proud of the way that we build out the organization. So it was very lean at the beginning, as you can imagine. Uh, but my very first hire, coincidentally, was a head of recruiting. So when you think about our business, so I tell when people ask me what I do, oh, I run a management company. But really, the true answer of what I do is I run a staffing agency and I run a technology company. Um, <laughs> which are two very different things, but 80% of our time ends up happening on the people front of the business. And so one of the most critical hires was to get that head of people so they could put the right person in the right seat. And we knew that, yes, you know, within 28 days, we launched 10 properties, but then six, less than 60 days later, we started adding property after property as we were an aggressive buyer during COVID. And then we were onboarding those internal um, assets that were already owned, but not managed. So we had to scale and grow very, very fast. So people was the number one hire. Um, the next hire then was a head of training and marketing. So knowing that our entire business plan is value add. So from a marketing perspective, you need somebody that's really got eyes on the brand and making sure that we're onboarding and setting those properties up successfully. Uh, she is over both disciplines, but we really focused on the marketing side of things first and then focused on training. And now she has a team of two trainers that work for her because I think a lot of people do sacrifice training at the beginning, but it's to the detriment. So when you're onboarding that many people and rolling out new systems for many of them, there is a significant amount of training that needs to take place. And it's not just, I've trained you once, you know what to do. It's ongoing. Um, so really categorizing that. And then the next hire um, was somebody that was my director of operations. So I already had um, an RPM that's now my RVP um, in the role to do the day-to-day. -day. But having somebody that was overseeing all of the technology from an operations perspective, as well as managing the entire transition process. So we've onboarded 62 properties, a little over 15,000 units in two years, and we're also dispoing some deals as well. So that's a lot of in and out, and you have to have a quarterback for that process to keep everybody on track and making sure things don't fall through the cracks, which they certainly did. And it's a we always say that every transition we get better and better because we do a debrief afterwards. Okay, what did we miss on this one and how can we document that so it doesn't happen again? So I think as you build out, um, we did, to your question on pricing, we, because we weren't large enough to have somebody in-house right out of the gate, we utilized our partner to do the pricing advisory services for us. But once we got to that point where we were about 40 properties, we then brought that function in-house because we knew the benefit that we would gather from that, having that person entrenched in our organization, understanding the business strategy of each of the assets, and being able to adjust accordingly. Uh, yeah, so uh, you also had a recruiter. I mean, that's an amazing, that's very, um, I think that's very forward-thinking as well, um, especially today in these days where we're really, we're short-staffed in the industry. Was there any... Was there any secret sauce to finding people to come into the company? Did, did you find any particular avenue of recruiting more, what more successful than another? Yes. So the person that I ended up hiring, she tried to recruit me um, in her former role um, at her former company, and she always stuck out. She said, I said to myself, when I need to hire somebody in recruiting, that's who I want to hire. And coincidentally, when I posted the job opening on LinkedIn, so I'm a huge believer of trying to source a network through LinkedIn. It's been very successful in my career. Before I could even reach out to her, she had already sent me a direct message asking for more information. So we really leverage, and my director of recruiting is, I think, in the top 5% of LinkedIn recruiters. She's constantly networking, constantly reaching out, to meet, uh, meet new people and start conversations even before we have positions available to generate excitement. Um, so we have our own Western Wealth Communities brand on social media, but she also has her own brand and she's posting a lot of things that she knows that job searchers are going to be looking for 
as it relates to showcasing our culture, showcasing our opportunity, and showcasing our growth. And that's been a huge success uh, to really mine LinkedIn, as well as utilize some of the other sites out there. And then forming partnerships to drive veterans to our properties. Uh, we're now a proud partner with Shelters to Shutters, and we hope to make our first placement. So all the different avenues to try and find the best talent for our organization is what we do. Well, that, that's, that's such a key thing to get right. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Was there, was there anything you found along the way was, that was harder than you expected? Anything somebody who's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here through the lens of those that are listening that, that might someday go on a similar journey of starting their own management company. Um, what, what obstacles lie in their path that, that uh, they might not see coming? Oh, goodness, everything. Um, you know, all joking aside. So my career had been spent at two really large organizations that had a large infrastructure. And so it's very different going from stabilized, well-known brands um, that have a structure in place. And so this type of opportunity, and this goes back to hiring and recruiting, is it takes a really unique type of person to want to be in a startup environment. It is not for everybody. So somebody that's used to working at a stable organization may not be a success um, at a startup company. It's not to say that they can't be. I, I you know, seem to think that I transitioned pretty well into that, but it isn't, it isn't for everybody. The pace and the growth and the scalability that's required um, is very different. And so we spend a lot of time on the front end on the recruiting and the interviewing process to really lay out the good, the bad, and the ugly um, and what that looks like in an organization. So trying to be as transparent as possible of what they are going to encounter. So trying to get to the bottom of if you're used to having a full policy and procedure manual on day one and you are very black and white, this may not be the place for you. Uh, because we're building things, I, I think I even mentioned to you when we had coffee recently, is that we, we were building the plane while we were flying it. And some people that are scared of flying, that doesn't sit well. Um, some people that would jump out of an airplane, this is the environment for them. So just being very upfront and very transparent about what the expectations are, what the pace will be like, and what the expectations are, I think will really do somebody well. Um, but you, you learn things every day, things that you take for granted um, that maybe a, an established company already had figured out, you need to figure out on your own. And for some people, that's really empowering and really inspiring because it allows every single employee in our company to have a voice and we made a lot of mistakes out of the gate, um, things that were overlooked or things that just didn't happen. And we were fortunate enough that our employees raised their voice and said, hey, have you ever thought about this? Or did you realize the employee handbook doesn't have this written in it? And because we were a small company, we were very nimble and we were able to take that feedback, make the changes, and then communicate it out to the employees so they really felt like, okay, this company has my back and they're listening to what we have to say. And so I'm going to continue to speak up when I see something else that I think should be different. Yeah, psychological safety, such an important aspect of, of any organization, the ability to, to make mistakes and ask questions in a safe environment. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, Jennifer, I, I, we haven't even started talking yet about what I, what I, what, I wanted to talk about today based on because you have such a great experience on the operations and and technology side of things. So I think I think we're gonna we're gonna use what we just talked about, and that's kind of going to be one half of this. We're gonna talk about the the experience of starting um, a a management company from scratch because you've shared some great things there. I think the focus on the the, the people need to be focused at the outset on training, you know, on people is quite a revelation because. Those things are, I, I know when I, 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 admittedly, when I started the management company, I started, you know, 10 years ago, um, uh, I definitely missed out on those things. I was such, I was, I had this asset manager mentality, right? That we were going to, we were going to focus on kind of operations piece first and fix stuff in the people. And that was not right. This is a people first industry. Um, and what you said earlier really resonated with me. And this is a great 
transition, you said that, you know, you are, you're not really the property manager business, you're in the people business, which we talked a bit about that already and the importance of finding the right people, recruiting. Um, you talk about policies and procedures that are in place. That's, that's also important. We'll talk about that fits in, but, but you're also a technology company. So let's talk a, a bit about that. Thank you for joining us at this week's episode of the Apartment Academy podcast. The Apartment Academy is a production of Leonardo 24-7, the industry's leader in multifamily operations and maintenance software. At Apartment Academy, we realize the hard work that goes into property management and the stress that comes along with it. Leonardo 24-7 takes the guesswork out of your team's day-to-day -day by providing customized daily guidance on tasks that need to be done, guaranteeing consistent operations across your entire portfolio. To learn more, visit www.leonardo247.com today.